Hello, and welcome to a digital statistics lecture for Salt Lake Community College. In this video, we're going to be going through section 4.2 for Math 1040, the least squares regression line. Now, uh, this is going to uh, continue on from where we did with 4.1, where we were calculating the correlation coefficient to determine how linear something was. Now what we're going to do is, once we've confirmed something to be linear, what we're then going to do is try to come up with the line that we would use to predict uh, the values in that uh, correlation. Uh, for example, here we have a, a set of information and a plot already made for distance versus club head speed. So we have x being how fast a, an individual is swinging a club, uh, so a golf club. And then how far in Y, so how far in yards, the ball is going to be hit. So if you swing the uh, golf club at 100 miles per hour, then that uh, made the golf ball go 257 yards. If you swung the golf club at 103 miles, that uh, we observed then the golf ball went 274 miles or yards. That is already plotted for us here. So we have our scatter plot, and then we have a line that we use to try to predict that. Now our goal now is going to try to be to calculate that line and come up with the equation for that line. Since it is a line, it's going to be in the form of y equals mx plus b in terms of a slope and a y-intercept, or as we're more often going to see it here, y equals ax plus b. So that's what our goal is going to be here. And here's some definitions for that. So I'm going to keep going up to that so we can point out some things. Uh, first, when you're looking at a plot, uh, what we're going to try to do with the line that we make is try to reduce what we call residuals. Residuals are the difference between what you observe and what you predict to happen. So the vertical difference between what you observe and what you predict. Graphically, what that looks like up here is this blue point down here is what we observed. And then the vertical distance up to the line, that right here is the residual. So that right there is the residual for that point. Likewise, for this dot down to here, that is the residual there. Same thing for that one, for that one, to that one. Our goal is to try to create a line that reduces these residuals as much as possible. This is why there's not going to be multiple different options for an equation of a line. There's going to be one that reduces the residuals as much as humanly possible. Um, that's the one that we're going to find here. Uh, so that's, that's what we're overall going to try to do. That's what uh, the line is going to be called, or that's what the line is going to do, and we're going to call it a least squares regression line or for short, LSR line. It's going to try to reduce the squared residuals as much as, you, as possible. For those that remember my description of the standard deviation, it should be kind of familiar to that, where you're trying to reduce the squared deviations from all the values. It's pretty similar to how that one runs. The least squares regression line we define with the symbol Y hat, so Y hat equals and it's going to be in the form of, as it says here, B1X plus B sub zero. Um, that's the general form for regression analysis. However, for us, for more simplistic terms, it's more gonna be Y hat equals AX plus B. Um, the two values that we're gonna find are A and B. A is going to represent the slope of the graph and B is going to represent the Y intercept of the graph. We're gonna go uh, more in depth of what each of those mean and how to analyze them in a little bit, but those are the two pieces we're going to find. We then hopefully should be able to use that line as a prediction purpose, so we should be able to plug in values for the explanatory, or x, to get a value for y, or y hat. Now, uh, we are going to try to predict and interpret and analyze the, both the slope and the y-intercept. Um, the slope will always have meaning as long as the, the relationship is linear. So as long as the relationship is linear, the slope will be fine to interpret. However, the y-intercept is more of a question. A lot of the times, the y-intercept will not have meaning, and there's some reason for that. This is what that note goes over. The note says we can only interpret the y-intercept uh, when x equals 0, which is where the y-intercept is, if x equals 0 is reasonable. The y-intercept, if you draw the, the line, so if this is my line, the y-intercept is supposed to be where the line intercepts the y-axis. Therefore, that's when x equals zero. 
If x equals 0 does not make any logical sense, then that means the y-intercept doesn't have any reason behind it. Um, and most of the time, that will be the case. For example, the one that we were just dealing with, club head speed and distance traveled. My question would be, if I have x is club head speed, does x equals 0 miles per hour make sense as a logical speed to hit a golf ball? The answer to that should be no. You should not hit a golf ball at zero miles per hour because that means it did not move. Um, therefore, we should not try to interpret whatever the y-intercept would be in the equation of the line. Another reason we would not interpret the y-intercept for that one is because observations near x equals zero did not exist. If you have observations near x equals zero, then that means you have more credence to try to evaluate what x equals zero is. The reason for that is because the line itself is only useful for the range of observations that we have. So if you notice the way that we have this plot made, if I erase everything else so you can see more clearly, um, the way that I have this plot made, the line only goes from the lowest observed point up to the highest observed point. It does not continue past that. The reason is because I have only confirmed, or I can only confirm, that a linear relationship exists within the range of my observations. Since I have no idea what happens up there, I should likewise not predict what happens past what I have observed as well. If I even think about it logically, if this did follow a linear pattern for uh, club head speed and distance, it would not make sense to continue that linear pattern overall physics exists, which means that no matter how fast you hit a golf ball, it can only really go so far without it being dragged back down to Earth via gravity. So there should be a point where that linear trend starts to follow a different trend instead. Overall, do not, do not, do not ever use values outside of your prediction line. Um, that's going to be another argument for why the y-intercept is not good, because x equals zero would be way not even here, if you notice that Lotus x value we have is 99, x equals 0 would be way over there. I don't have any observations even close to that. So, I should not try to predict it. Okay, so most of the time, we're not going to interpret the y-intercept because it doesn't have much meaning. We will have an instance later on, though, where it does. Okay, so... That uh, this first note on the next page is what I was just talking about. Do not try to predict outside the scope of the model, which means that you should not use the regression model to make predictions for values of the explanatory variable that are much larger or much smaller than those observed. So do not predict outside of what you observe. That's a very, very important point. You will sometimes be asked to maybe make those predictions, and you should instead say no. Sometimes the appropriate answer to some questions in regression analysis is no, I can't do that. The second note says, do not use the regression model to predict when the correlation coefficient indicates no linear relation. That should also make sense. If there is no linear relationship, then you should not use the line because the line is garbage. It does not work or does not help to predict anything. If you still need to predict though, even when there's no linear relationship, the best we can do is simply to use the average. So the best you can do instead is to use y hat. If you remember, x hat is also known as the mean for the variable x. y hat would simply be the mean for the variable y. If in the previous situation for club head speed and distance traveled, if I found no linear relationship and I needed to predict uh, how far it would travel if I hit the ball 104 miles per hour, which would be within my range, um, my, my guess for that would be to simply take all the values for y and find the average of them. That's the best prediction I can use if I do not have a linear relationship. So that's also very important. Lastly, do not use an observed values of prediction. This may sound obvious, but I have a lot of people do this, where maybe I, ha I ask you to find the or what you would predict the golf ball to travel if you hit it 103 miles per hour. 103 miles per hour may have been an observed value, but an observed value is not a prediction. An observed value helps you make a prediction. So do not use observed values or values from the data set to make a specific prediction. You should only be using the least squares regression lines of prediction, or if there's no linear relation, you should be using the average. All right, so those are three very important points. Make sure you do have those starred, make sure you do have those down. 
Okay, now to find the least greatest regression line, we've actually already been doing this. It's the same as we've been doing before. We are still going to use linreg ax plus b. So we're still going to be using that same program. All right, um, now in this case, we're only going to have two lists that we're going to use in this section. The rest of the list, we actually already have the printouts made for you. So the only list I want you to have plugged in are these two here on page eight, I guess. Um, I have weight here on list one, and I have miles per gallon on list two. Now, I've gone through this before in previous videos, but if you need to clear out values in a list, the fastest way to do so is to go to a list. For example, I'll show how to clear out list three here. I'll go to a list, go to the top of the list, so I highlight the list itself. So you should see I have L3 equals or whatever list I want to clear out. And then I hit the uh, button clear. Very important, hit clear, do not hit delete. That does something dangerous. If you hit clear, if you notice, now it says L3 equals blank. And it hasn't updated yet on the list itself, but to do so, I need to hit enter, and there you go. L3 has now been cleared out. So be very careful of that. Um, that's the fast way to clear things out if you need to, because we are going to use a lot of lists specifically in this section. Okay, um, so this question. An engineer wants to determine how the weight of a car X affects gas mileage Y. The following data represents the weights of various domestic cars and their miles per gallon in the city for the 2015 model year. So we have all of these cars here. So the Buick, LaCrosse, uh, La Cadillac XTS, all the way down to Lincoln MXZ. All right. Um, so what we're going to do first is determine the least squares regression line and the correlation coefficient. So we have L1 and L2 as weight in miles per gallon, and we want to make sure that that direction is important. Let's see here. An engineer wants to determine how the weight of the car X affects the gas mileage Y. So that means weight is X, gas mileage is Y, so weight is going to be your explanatory here. It could have been the other way around. We do need to be careful. If we're not sure, you can always check the description of the situation. That always helps. Since we know which one is X and Y, we can go run linreg AX plus B, which if you remember from 4.1, you hit stat, go over to calculate tab, and you want the fourth option there, linreg AX plus B. My X list we determined was weight, so L1. My Y list is L2. Remember, if you do not have the wizard, you'd be typing in L1, comma, L2. Don't worry about frequency list or store reg EQ. We could just hit calculate, and we should get all the information we need. Now, our least squares regression line, which is Y hat, if you notice at the top of my calculator, it says y equals ax plus b, and then it gives us what a and b are. That's going to be how I write down my equation of the line. a in this case is negative 0.0046, which I guess is negative 0.005. So I'm going to say y hat equals negative 0.005x, because I don't know what X is, and B is 37 point, I'll keep three decimal places as well, so 37.357, where negative 0 0.005 is A, and this is B. That is how you would write down the equation of the line. What I and, and other instructors do not want to see is we do not want you to see write down y equals ax plus b and then say a is this and b is this. We do not want to see that. So do not just regurgitate exactly what you see on the calculator printout there. You should be able to use a, plug it into the equation, and use b, plug into the equation. The reason for that is because we are hopefully about to use this equation as long as it is a linear relationship. So you want to have this equation down. Now it asks us for the uh, least squares regression line, which is this. That's L the LSR line. And it also asks us for the correlation coefficient. The correlation coefficient we talked about in 4.1, that's our value for R, which is going to determine if there's a relationship or not. R in the printout is negative 0.842. Keep in mind that negative, that's going to be important. 
With that correlation coefficient, we should hopefully now determine if there's a significant linear correlation. Well, to do so, step one, we found our correlation coefficient. R was negative 0.842. Step two, we're going to need to find our critical value. To do so, we find what our sample size is. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten cars analyzed. And so with that in mind, we can go find what the critical value is by going to the table, which I believe is on page four of your notes. I'm going to scroll up to that real quick. So if I go to the table on page four, I want to go down to my indicated sample size of 10, and I find my critical value to be 0.632. So critical value is 0.632. So that's my second step. My third step is that I'm going to compare the two. Specifically, I want to compare the absolute value of R to the critical value, see which one is is higher. The absolute value of R would make this 0.842, critical value would be 0.632, and therefore 0.8 is bigger than 0.6, so the absolute value of R is greater than the critical value. Again, we want to look at the absolute value of R because otherwise any negative relationship would always be implied as none. Our last step, number four, is going to be our conclusion. So our conclusion, based on all, all this information, is that, yes, a negative linear relationship exists. So because the absolute value of R was bigger than the critical value, there is a linear relationship and it is negative because R was negative. So this answers all that, finds all the information, answers why because of that critical value comparison. So we're all good. All right, now C, interpret the slope and the y-intercept if appropriate. All right, so I'll do slope first. Crossover, uh, give, maybe give me some more room. Now, I'll do this with typing, a little bit better. Okay, so how to interpret the slope and the y-intercept. Um, the best way to interpret the slope. The slope is going to be a little bit tricky at first, but it's going to follow a same general trend every time. The best way to think about a slope is by considering back in uh, algebra, if you took algebra, slope is always defined, I'll write it down here and erase this in a bit, slope is always defined as rise over run. And the way we're going to determine that is by defining the rise over run by looking at our slope value. Our slope is negative 0 0.005, so negative 0 0.005. And I can define my run by just putting the number one under that. Anything over the number one is just the same number. Run is the x direction, so this is for the x direction, and that's for the y direction. And that's kind of how we're going to interpret it. We're going to say as the x increases by 1, the y will decrease by that number. So we're going to kind of interpret it in the slope intercept or uh, rise over run kind of fashion. So we'll say as x, which we determined x was weight of the vehicle, so as weight increases by one pound. The response to that, the y variable, which is miles per gallon, the miles per gallon decreases by uh, 0 0.005 mpg, I guess. So I'll say, to make that sound better, the gas mileage decreases by 0 0.005 miles per gallon. That's how you're going to interpret the slope. And you're going to follow that same general cadence in most cases with the slope. As the x increases by 1, the y will change by whatever the slope is. So in this case, as the weight increased by 1, the gas mileage decreased by 0.005. All right, now for the y-intercept. 
Remember, the y-intercept is uh, very often not able to be interpreted because it most of the time does not make sense. In order to see that, what we want to do is check to see if x equals 0 makes logical sense and we have observations around it. Well, x is weight. So then we need to ask the question, does a car of uh, weight of 0 pounds make sense? The answer to that should be an obvious no. It does not make sense to have a car that weighs nothing. Um, also, looking at my observations, my observations are all in the thousands. I don't have any observations even close to zero pounds. So the y-intercept is not appropriate because a car of zero pounds does not make sense. And we also don't have any observations near x equals zero. So a couple reasons why the y-intercept is not appropriate in this specific example. All right, so that's how you interpret the slope of the y-intercept. We're going to have a couple more examples. Where we're going to do that uh, again. So don't worry about that if that's giving you trouble. Uh, D, what would you predict the mean fuel consumption to be for a 3,000 pound car. Okay, well, in part B, we determined that there's a linear relationship, so the line should be able to be used. We hopefully should be able to use the equation of that line. So I'm going to write it again down here. So y hat equals negative 0.005x plus 37.357. We hopefully should be able to use the equation of the line. However, just checking to see if it's linear is not enough. What we do need to check is that 3,000 pound car. Remember, we can only use the line for values that are within my observations. So I need to make sure that 3,000 pounds is within my observation range, or what we call our scope. Looking at my values, I see a lot of 4,000s and 3,000s, but I do see a number both below 3,000 and a number above 3,000. Because of that, that means that 3,000 is within the scope of my observations, so I should be able to use the line to predict with that amount of weight. If, for example, I was trying to predict for a car that weighs 2,000 pounds, I don't have any predictions near that. It's outside of my scope, so I would not try to predict. But 3,000 pounds is okay. Uh, so 3,000 pounds, 3,000 pounds is my x value. We remember we determined that the explanatory was pounds or uh, weight of the car. So we're going to plug 3,000 pounds into the equation right there. This is another way to check to see if you've done questions right. It's a little bit meta, but if you look at the questions uh, later on, and for example, this one's asking me to make a prediction for 3,000 pounds. That should imply that my explanatory value variable probably should have been pounds. If I did it wrong and chose miles per gallon as my weight or as my explanatory, and I, was, I saw this question, this would maybe make me go back and check to see if I did it right. So what we're going to do is go to our calculator here, and we're going to try to calculate this. So we're going to hit negative point. 005. Make sure you hit the negative next to the decimal. Don't do the minus above plus. That's a that's a different symbol. So negative 0 0.005 times 3,000, which I'll do in parentheses because it, it's nice and separated. And then add 37.357. Hit enter, and we get our fuel consumption for the 3,000-pound car as 22. Uh, I'll just put the whole three, three, five, seven miles per gallon. That's my prediction for a car that has 3,000 pounds. Lastly, a particular 3,000 pound car gets 34 miles per gallon. So this, whoop. So this 34 miles per gallon with the 3,000 pound car, that is an observation. What is the residual? Okay, so the residual, if you remember, the residual is the difference between what you observe minus what you predict. In this case, our observed value was 34 miles per gallon. And what I predicted in the previous case was 22.357 miles per gallon. 
So 34 minus 22.357, we get a residual of 11.643. Since that residual is positive, since it is positive, that means that the residual is above the predicted value for the car that weighs 3,000 pounds. That means that in my scatter plot, whatever the scatter plot looked like, I observed this value, but I predicted this one. Our value had a positive residual, which means the observed was higher than what we thought it was. So that's going to be our answer there. Okay. Now, usually the most complicated thing there is interpreting the slope and the y-intercept. And we are going to do a couple more examples of this. Just know that for the next couple, we already have the printouts made for you. Recall up the Gallup Organization Survey of Adult Americans regarding their commute times to work and a level of well-being from Chapter 4.1. Uh, we already answered part A back in 4.1. We used commute time as X and Gallup Healthway's uh, well-being score as Y. So X was time, and the response variable was the score that they have. We already determined that back in 4.1, so you can check your notes for that. Uh, for part B, find the least, which is helpful because we need time is X, score is Y. Uh, for part B, find the least squares regression line and the correlation coefficient given the output. So this output's already made for you. If you want to check this, you can plug in this into your calculator and find this using linreg AX plus B. Uh, our least squares regression line is going to be Y hat equals A. A is negative 0 0.048 times X plus B, which is 69.029, or I guess 69.03. Then our correlation coefficient, R, is negative 0.981. All right, so we got all our information there. C, we technically already answered back in 4.1 as well, but I'll run through it real quick. Is there a significant linear relation and why? Well, to do so, we already did our first step. We found R is negative 0.981. Then our second step, we need to find the critical value by looking at what the sample size is. The sample size here is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 individuals, so 7. And with that, we can find our critical value using that table on page 4. So let's scroll back up to that. If I recall, it's 0.7 something. Yep. So our sample size was 7. Therefore, our critical value is 0.754. This is back on page 4. Critical value is 0.754. All right. So we've got R. We've got our critical value. Step 3 is compare. Absolute value of R compared to the critical value. R is 0.981. Critical value is 0.754. So 0.981 is bigger. So we have R is greater. And therefore, yes, a negative linear relationship exists. There's a linear relationship because R beat the critical value, and it's negative because R was negative. Note that when you make your conclusion, you do always need to say that it's positive or negative and that it's linear. You always need to say it's linear because um, either if it is linear or if there's no linear. That word linear is important. All right, now to our new stuff. Interpret the slope and the y-intercept if appropriate. So I'll type that down again. All right, so let's put that up here. So slope. So the slope, if we see, is negative 0 0.048 or so. Yeah, negative 0 0.048. And again, we want to think about the slope as the x increasing by 1 and the y changing by that slope. So x is time. So we're going to say, whoops, sorry. Um, as time, or I'll say even better, as commute time increases by one minute, 
Note this is following the same cadence as last time. As x increases by 1, you'll always start with that. As x increases by 1, then the y variable, which is the composite score, the um, Gallup composite score will decrease because it's negative, and it decreases by 0 0.048 points. All right, so that's how you would interpret the slope. As x increases by 1, the y changes by whatever the slope is. We're allowed to interpret the slope as long as we have a linear relationship, which we confirmed there was one in part c. The y-intercept is a lot trickier for this specific example, though. Um, the y-intercept, if you recall, the y-intercept is only supposed to be analyzed if, you have, if it makes logical sense and you have values close to 0. Well, in this case, some would initially say that a commute time of zero minutes doesn't make sense. However, it could easily be argued that a commute time of zero minutes means that you work from home. And particularly with what happened in this uh, year of April and May, um, that should be familiar to quite a few people. So zero minutes commuting from home, that could still give you a well-being score. So that could make sense. The question, though, of if you have values around zero. We do have a value kind of close to that. We have five minutes. Five minutes is pretty close to zero. Some would say it's not close enough, and so would say that the winery set is still not appropriate because we don't have observations near it. However, in this case, I would personally say that five minutes is not far off. At least it's not far enough off to throw it out. So I'm going to interpret the winery set in this case because of that, and I am going to argue with that with those points. So I'm going to say um, that uh, because we have observations around x equals 0 and x equals 0 makes sense, we will interpret the y-intercept as the score one would rate their well being as if they if they maybe work from home which is a commute time of zero minutes Just trying to cover all bases i want an argument as to why i'm allowed to interpret the y-intercept make, making sure i address both that it makes sense and i have values around it and then trying to just interpret it and interpreting it is just trying to see how how it makes sense. So if you first already chose and saw that it does make sense, you then need to talk about what it means then. So since I said that zero minute commute time would imply somebody works from home, then I simply just need to say that it would be their composite score if they commute from home or if they work from home. That's all I need to do for the y-intercept. All right, now for our predictions. Uh, for E and F, both ask us to make some predictions, and we already have a linear relationship as we confirmed in Part C, so we're okay to make predictions uh, using the line. Uh, Well-being for a uh, commute time of 30 minutes. Okay, well, let's check 30 minutes in our observations. Make sure I have observations above and below that. Uh, 30 minutes would be between 25 and 35, so it's all good. I should be able to use the line. So I'm going to use Y hat equals negative 0 0.048, and we're going to plug in 30 minutes into where x is, plus 69.03. So we have negative 0 0.048 times 30, plus 69.03. And we get a a uh, composite score of 67.59 points. Note that I just checked above to see if I had observations near 30. I didn't see to I didn't go up to see if there was an observation of 30 to just use that. Do not use observations for predictions. Just try to make sure that you have observed values around that so you can use the line. That's all I was doing. Likewise, I'm going to do the same thing as I did for 30 for the next question for 180. 
So we know we can use the line because the uh, part C said there is a linear relation, but I want to check to see if 180 is within my scope. And unfortunately, looking at my data here, the highest value I have is 105 minutes. I do not have any predictions or any observations past that, so I should not be able to make a prediction. Therefore, even though this question says to predict the well-being for somebody who has a commute time of 180 minutes, I'm going to say no. It is not appropriate to predict for this commute time since it lies outside of the scope of observed data. Or simply, it is outside of the scope. That's all you really need to say. But yeah, kind of interesting that in this class, in this kind of section, you can look at a question that asks you to do something and say no while getting the question correct. Lastly, suppose Barbara has a 20 minute commute time and scores 67.3 on a survey. So again, this 67.3, that is going to be my observation for Barbara. Is Barbara more or less well off than the typical individual with a 20 minute commute? All right, well, that's basically asking for our residual. Remember the residual is the observed minus the predict and we have our observed value of 67.3, but we don't have our predicted value yet. We need to find this. To do so, we're going to use our equation of the line. And we're going to plug in 20 to find a prediction for that. Note that also 20 is within the scope of the data because the scope went from 5 to 103. If I plug in 20, that's going to give us our prediction for somebody with a 20 minute commute. So negative 0 0.048 times 20 plus 69.03. We get 68.07. So that's my prediction for somebody with a 20 minute commute. Therefore, if I do the subtraction now, if I do 67.3 minus 68.07, what I get is negative 0.77. Therefore, my conclusion for this is that since the residual is negative, then that means that Barbara has a commute or has a well-being score below what I would predict. So we believe that she is less well off than the typical individual. That would be my prediction for this. So the residual is less it is less than one, it's or is less than zero, so it's negative. And because it's negative, that means that her value is below what I predicted it to be. And the higher the well being score, logically the better. So she has a lower well being score than I predicted that she would have. Therefore she's less well off. Okay. We have one more question here on page 10. And again, we have a printout for this. The following table and scatter plot shows the relationship between the average amount of time that someone wastes at work per day, Y, with the year of their birth, X, for nine individuals. So we have year of birth and we have time wasted. All right, looking at this graph, that looks horrible. I don't really see any linear relationship here at all. Maybe something like this, but that does horribly to try to account for these residuals. So I don't really see a very good linear relationship here at all. And likewise, if I were to look at my printout here, that kind of confirms that. The printout gives us a least squares regression line of y hat equals negative 0 0.016x plus 33.464, but it also gives us a R value or a correlation coefficient value of just negative 0.288, which is rather low. It's pretty close to zero.
And we can show that there is no negative relationship without just saying that, yeah, it looks bad or the correlation coefficient is low. We can confirm that using our four step process. So we have R is negative 0.288. Then we can find our critical value by using our sample size. It said in the description that these are nine individuals. So if I go back to table two on page four, I should be able to find our critical value. So again, go back up to table two. You'll be using that table a lot, so tab that if you haven't already. Um, we have nine, so our critical value is 0.666. Then with step three, we compare the two. Specifically, we compare the absolute value of R to the critical value, see which one is larger. Absolute value of R would be 0.288, critical value is 0.666. So in this case, the critical value actually is larger. Because the critical value exists, we say that no linear relationship exists. Again, keep in mind that even though no, no relationship exists, I do need to define that no linear relationship exists. I don't know. Maybe this does define some weird curvy linear shape I'm not thinking. Maybe it defines some shape like this. I'm not exactly sure. All I can say is that there is no linear relationship. Okay. Well, since no linear relationship exists... That means that on part C, where it asks us to use the pre to predict the number of hours wasted at work for someone who was born in 2000, that means we cannot use the equation of the line to predict this, but we can instead use something else. And what we can use uh, is the average. So we, we can use the average uh, time wasted for individuals. So to do that, we just need to go through this list. So I'm going to go to stat, edit. I'm going to put that list of time wasted into L3. So 0 0.5, 0 0.68. I'm going to put that list here into list three. And what we're going to do is find the average for that list. Note that I'm not using the year of birth because that was our X uh, value. Okay, got all of them in there now. Um, so we don't need to use the year of birth. We are only trying to find the average for Y. That's the only one that we care about. So I got those in list three. So I'm going to go and find the average by doing our old friend from chapter three by doing stat, calculate, and run one bear stats. And I run one bear stats on list three. If I do that, I get my average. Whoop. I get my average there of 0.826. So that is going to be my prediction. I'll say y hat equals 0.826. That is my prediction. And that's a prediction I would make for anybody within the scope of my data, 2000 is within the scope of my data because it goes from uh, 1992 and I have 2004. So I have dates, dates of birth with around 2000. Um, uh, that's the prediction I would use for any dates within my scope because there is no linear relationship. With that said though, that's everything that I have uh, for 4.2. I will also note that for the last question, since there is no linear relationship, uh, you, you also cannot interpret either the slope or the y-intercept, simply because there is no linear relationship. Um, at this point, you should be able to complete all the homework for section 4.2, so I recommend doing that before you move on into 4.3 and 4.4. If you have any questions, feel free to put those in the comments below or to ask your instructor. Uh, but with that said, I hope you have a nice day.